This audio is brought to you by Muslim Central. Please consider donating to help cover our running costs and future projects by visiting www.muslimcentral.com forward slash donate. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسول رب الشرح صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي When talking about the subject of dunya, I think it's important for us to understand the nature of dunya. Because before you can be successful in any journey, you have to know what is your goal, and you have to understand how you're going to get there. In order to be successful in this journey of crossing dunya, we have to know what is dunya. The Prophet ﷺ He tells us in many different prophetic teachings, in many different ahadith, about how to view this life. In one of them, he says, Be in this life like a stranger, ka'annaka gharib, as if you are a stranger or a traveler, a wayfarer. I want us to think about this advice for a moment. It's very, it seems very simple and short. But as is, you know, the Prophet ﷺ, when he tells us something, he tells us in a few words something that is so profound. When you think about being a traveler, now I right now I'm a traveler. I'm visiting your beautiful country and then I'm leaving shortly thereafter. What is the mindset of a traveler? Ask yourself, the last time you were traveling, what was your mindset? Think about the hotel room that you were staying in. My question to you is, when you go and you stay at a hotel, when you're traveling, how many of you go into the hotel, look around and say, okay, now I want to start decorating this room. Now I'm going to go to the store and I'm going to spend all this money so that I can decorate my room. And then we go to the bedspread and we say, oh my, this bedspread, it is the wrong color. And we go and we throw it out and we go and we go to get a new bedspread. No one does this. Why? Why don't we act this way when we're staying at a hotel room? The reason is very simple. The reason is we know that we're only staying there for a short time and then we're leaving. How many of you become really attached to your hotel bed? Like, you just don't want to let it go. There's a chair in the room and you just, you just become in love with the chair and you don't want to let it go. Nobody does that. Again, it is just a temporary place and then you're leaving. You don't invest a lot of money in furnishing your hotel room, correct? You don't become obsessed or attached to the furniture in your hotel room. The reason is that you know that you're leaving. Similarly, if your hotel bed isn't the most comfortable, you know, you, it, it's just not the best bed in the world, which typically they aren't. It's not the most comfortable. Your pillow, it's not that comfortable. How many of you make a big deal out of that? It's okay. Why is it okay? Why is it okay to be a little bit uncomfortable in a hotel room? Because you know that you're staying there for a short time and then you're leaving. There is a natural sense of detachment when you are a traveler. Because you're like, it's okay, I can handle it for a few days. It's not, the big, it's not that big of a deal. I'm leaving. Now, how does this apply to this life? The Prophet ﷺ is advising us to have that mindset in this life. That I'm only in this place for a short time and then I'm leaving. Just like you don't get attached to your hotel bed and your hotel chair and you don't start spending lots of money furnishing it, 
we should have that same mindset in this life. It does not mean that we can't have nice things. It does not mean that we can't furnish those you know, rooms that we have or, or that we have things which are um, comfort. However, there is a big difference between having things that you own and letting those things own you. So when we have things of dunya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He covers us with gifts. We all are drowning in gifts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He gives us money, He gives us health, He gives us, he gives us status, He gives us beauty, He gives us youth, He gives us our families, our children, our spouses. But the problem is that when Allah gives us a gift, we should appreciate those gifts. And we should show gratitude for those gifts. But here's where the problem comes along. When we start to love the gift more than we love the giver. When we start to love the gift more than we love the giver. When we start to become dependent on the gift and we forget about the giver. How do we do that? For example, Allah gives us money. We know that Allah gives us money and all of the provision that we have because it's one of His attributes. Al-Razzaq. Al-Razzaq is the provider. But here's the problem. When He gives us money, we start to love the money more than we love the giver of the money. We start to depend on the money more than the giver of the money. How does this show in our life? Well, so long as we have the money, we feel safe. So long as my bank account is fat and heavy and full, I feel safe. I feel like I'm okay. But the moment that I lose money, now all of a sudden I don't feel safe anymore. What was I depending on? Am I depending on my bank account? Do I think that the money comes from my job? Do I think that the money comes from my boss? Or do I know that the money comes from the provider? Even when the money decreases in my bank account, is Allah still there? Is the provider still there? Did he go away? So we have to be careful where we put our dependence. And we have to be careful where we put our ultimate love. How do we start to love the gift more than the giver? I'll give you some very tangible, practical ways we do that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives gifts because Allah is al wahhab Allah loves to give gifts. But sometimes we become so attached to the gift, we forget about Allah. In the case of money, we become so consumed with getting more and more and guarding it and not losing any of it that we may even be put in situations where we have to make a choice. We have to choose between the love of our money and the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are faced with these choices all the time. For example, sometimes in order to have, or we think in order to help our business grow, we need to sell alcohol. Or in order to help our business grow, we need to take huge interest-bearing loans. Well, let's look at that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the giver, and Allah is the provider, and we are displeasing Him in order to get more provision. It doesn't make any sense. We are saying that, no, 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 I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sell alcohol and it's gonna give me more money. Well, what do I love most? Do I love the gift or do I love the giver? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does, does not approve of selling alcohol. But if I love my money more, then I will choose my money when I'm faced with that choice. If, if, if what I love most is to have a really big house and to have a certain kind of car, but to get that I have to pay interest, what am I going to choose? I choose what I love most. And unfortunately, we have put aside the giver 
because we're so in love with the gift. We're so in love with our money. We're so in love with our big houses. We're so in love with our fancy clothes and, and that status. This is a situation which so many of us fall into because we have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the gift and we love the gift more than the giver. Another example of this is the people that Allah puts in our life. We said that our spouse is a gift. Our children are gifts. But what a lot of us end up doing is we start to love our spouse and our children as we should only love Allah. But nobody says that, right? No one, no one's going to say, yeah, raise their hand and say, actually, over here, I love my spouse more than Allah. Or I love my children more than Allah. We don't say that with our tongues. But how do we show that with our actions? Again, when we are faced with a choice, a lot of times you hear people saying things like, you know, don't wear hijab because then you won't get married. Or take off your hijab so that you can get married. Or maybe take off your hijab because your husband wants you to. Here we are thinking that this, this person, you know, that we're going to get married to, where does this person come from? Your spouse is a provision from Allah. Your spouse is from Allah. So how does it make sense that you're going to anger the provider in order to get more provision? It doesn't make any sense. If you're trying to get a promotion, you don't get a promotion by disobeying the boss. Correct? We know this. But somehow we've forgotten that Allah is the source of all the things that we want. Allah is the source of that great spouse that we're taking off our hijab to get. Allah is the source of the provision that we're selling alcohol to increase. These are the things we do because we lose focus. And we start to focus on the gift and not the giver. The other subtle ways that you can see this is if you ask yourself just a few questions. Because see, the heart is something we can't like really see. You know, we can't see physically the spiritual heart, right? So it's very hard to know what is, what's in my heart. It's, it's, it's not something we can really like do a, a blood test and find out what do I love most. But there are indicators. One of the indicators, simple indicator, is what do you think about most? Simple. What do you think about all day long? What's always occupying your mind? There is a direct relationship between the heart, between your love, and your mind, your thoughts. So your thoughts are going to be a reflection of what you love most. What consumes you here, consumes you here. So you can ask yourself, and everyone is aware, what do you think about most? What are you spending your entire day worrying about? What is it related to? What do you think about while you're praying? Because, you know, most of the time it's not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're praying to Him, but our heart is thinking about everything else. Our heart is thinking about our children or our husband or whatever's in the oven or, you know, where we have to go, what we're going to wear, you know, what's on TV, what, what, what that person said about me, what that person did to me, that's what we're thinking about. Ask yourself, what is it that makes you most angry? What is it that makes you most sad? And look at your fear, because fear is an indicator of ultimate love. The thing that you're most afraid of, the thing that you're most afraid of losing. You know we have things in our life that we are terrified of losing? And actually just the thought of losing it can cause a physical reaction, like our heart will start pounding, we might start sweating, you might even get into a panic at the thought of losing that thing. You need 
to look at that. Every individual needs to look at their own heart and look at what is it really that I love most. And most of the time we will find that when we answer these questions, what am I thinking about all day? What's the first thing on my mind when I wake up in the morning? What keeps me up at night so I can't sleep? What keeps me from being able to eat? What's the last thing I think about before I sleep? What am I most afraid of? What makes me most angry? And you'll find that the answer to those questions has nothing to do with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Typically, the answer to those questions are the gifts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So do you see what's happening here? What's supposed to be on our mind most? It's our Creator. What's supposed to be the first thing we think about when we wake up in the morning? La ilaha illallah. The first thing you're supposed to say when you get up. But it's not what's on our mind. What's supposed to be the thing that we're most afraid of losing? It isn't supposed to be our money or our spouse or our children. It's supposed to be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what have we done? We have taken these things which were gifts and we've put them in a place that only Allah should be. What's the result of doing that? Allah tells us in the Qur'an again and again, we, we, we hear about Jahannam, we know and we think about Jahannam as being something far away, right? Jahannam, hellfire. We think of it as being something far away. It's in the hereafter. Yeah, that torture and that torment is far away. But what we don't realize is that the torment and the torture of taking something other than Allah and loving it as you should only love Allah will torment you and torture you in this life before the next life. That same thing that answers all these questions, what do I think about most? What am I most afraid of losing? What makes me angry? What's the first thing on my mind? What do I think of in my salah? That same thing, whether it is your family, your kids, your husband, your status, your, your money, what's this person saying about me? What's that person saying about me? My image in front of people, what do people think? Whatever it is, that same thing will become the cause of your greatest pain and torment. You see how it works? Because you're not supposed, it's, you're taking something, Allah has designed this universe in a specific way. Allah has designed the human heart in a specific way. When you change that design, when you go against that design, you feel the pain. Because you're going against the law of the universe. What is the law of the universe? La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah is not just a statement that we say. In fact, we say it many times a day, but it isn't just a statement. When you're saying la ilaha illallah, you are saying that there is nothing worthy of being put at the center of my life except for God. There is nothing else worthy of being what occupies my mind all day long. There is nothing else worthy of being the first thing I think about when I wake up in the morning, the last thing I think about before I sleep, what occupies my mind during salah. There is nothing else worthy of being that important, of defining me in that deep of a way, except for God. That's Tawheed. That's what it means to be a Muslim. Allah has designed the world, the universe, the human being around La ilaha illallah. When you go against La ilaha illallah and you take your money and you make that your ilah, you will suffer because you're going against the law of the universe. When you take your spouse and you put your spouse in that place, you will suffer. When you take your children and you put your children in that place, you will suffer. You will feel it because you're going against the law of the universe. This isn't how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala designed it. Allah made our hearts in such a way that they were that it is only to be filled by Him. 
And so when you fill something with a substance that it wasn't intended to be filled with, it breaks. When you go to the gas station and you need to fill up your gas tank and you decide that today, you know, you're not going to put gasoline in the gas tank, today you're going to put orange juice. Well, not a very smart decision because what happens? What happens is your car is not going to work and in fact you will break that car. When you fill the gas tank with orange juice, you're filling it with something that it was not designed to be filled with. Our hearts are the same. Our hearts are like a cup. And you can fill that cup with whatever you choose. But if you choose to fill it with this life, if you choose to fill it with dunya, if you choose to fill it with money, if you choose to fill it with status, if you choose to fill it with what people think, then that cup will break. That heart will never feel at rest. That heart will not feel peace until it is filled with what it was designed to be filled with. And that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the remembrance of Allah, not the remembrance of the creation. We should not be obsessing our minds and our hearts with anything other than our Creator. Now this brings us to the question of, well, what about all these roles that we have to play? We can't go and live in the mountains and we can't just be in the masjid all day and all night. So how do we reconcile? See, Islam is the religion of fitra, the religion of our nature. Islam is a religion of the middle way. It does not tell us ever to take extremes. So when we talk about filling the heart with Allah and nothing else, it does not mean that you don't get married and have children and have jobs and get involved and enjoy yourself. No, 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 that's not what it means. It means that when you do have those things, they are in your hand and not in your heart. And there is a very, very deep difference between what you hold in your hand and what you hold in your heart. Because what you hold in your hand is something that you love and something that you enjoy, whether it is money or it is your husband or your wife or your children. But it does not become the center of your existence. It will not be what you think about all day. It will not be the first thing on your mind, the last thing on your mind, what makes you cry, what makes you happy, what makes you sad. No, no, that is for what's in your heart. So you understand here that what we have and we hold in our hand is something that we love, but something that we can ultimately live without. It means that when it is taken away from us, we don't crumble and die. We don't become so devastated that we can't find a purpose to continue to live. Lots of people have money, but they don't always hold it in the same place. Some people, you know, we know there were companions who were rich, but they held their money in their hand and not in their heart. What does that mean? What does that look like? It means that if it is taken away, it isn't the end of that person's life. It doesn't devastate. There is a beautiful example of this. Ibn uh, Abu Hanifa, one of the great scholars, he also had property, business, he had wealth. And while he was teaching one time, some people came to him and told him, your ships have sunk. So a portion of his wealth was presumably gone, lost. So what he did, is he paused, he was teaching, he paused, and then he said, Alhamdulillah, and then he continued teaching. A little while later, they came back to him and said, actually we made a mistake. It wasn't your ships that sunk. So again he paused. He said, Alhamdulillah. And then he continued teaching. So later on when he was asked what that was about, 
He said that when first you told me that I lost my ships, I paused and I examined my heart. And I found it unmoved. And so I said, Alhamdulillah, that my heart was unmoved by that. And then the second time when you told me that I had not lost my ships, again I paused and I examined my heart and I found it unmoved. So I said, Alhamdulillah, that my heart was unmoved. You understand here, he has the money, but if that money comes or that money goes, that's not what controls him inside. He is not controlled inside except by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Similarly, we interact with people, right? No one is going to tell you that you should go hide out and never see people. We get married, this is the sunnah of the Prophet them. We have children, we have families, we have parents, we must interact. But, what happens when the people are happy with you and they're praising you? How does that affect your heart? And then the next day they don't like you anymore. They're not pleased with you anymore. Now they're criticizing you. Now they don't love you anymore. I'm sorry I don't love you anymore. I, I think I'm going to leave now. What happens to you? If that person was in your heart and that person controlled you inside, then when they don't like you anymore or they're criticizing you, it breaks you inside. But if those people, yes, you love them, but your heart is for Allah, your heart is not moved by the movement of the creation. Your heart is only moved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then what that means is, yes, people come and they go from your life. People are going to be happy with you sometimes. Sometimes they're not going to be. Sometimes they're going to love you and sometimes they're going to hate you. But you don't allow your internal state to go up and down with the creation. Because your internal state should be stable with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Should be linked to your relationship with Him. And externally you interact with the creation. It isn't something that controls you inside. This is, some, this, is a, this is a goal, right? How do you get there? This seems very, you know, it seems very hard, right? Something far off. We can't really think about how do we do that? How do we love our families, for example, without allowing them to compete with the place that Allah should be inside? I think the easiest answer to that question is by thinking of this example. You know when a little kid first sees you know, a really special toy? Maybe that child is watching TV and sees a commercial. And on the commercial, there is this toy Ferrari. Okay? And the child falls in love with this toy. So that child becomes obsessed. Every day asking his parents, please, can I have that Ferrari? Please, can I have that toy? Please, can I? Finally, he gets it. Now that child holds on real tight to that toy, right? Try taking that toy out of the child's hand. It's not going to be easy, right? Because he is obsessed and in love and attached to that, to that toy. But what happens when that child grows up and sees a real Ferrari? What happens to that child's attachment to the lesser model? Now when you try to take that toy out of his hand, is it hard anymore? No, because his eyes are on the real thing, the real Ferrari. What does that have to do with us? The reason we become so attached to this life is because we don't see anything better. We don't really see the better life. So we don't have anything better to, to compare it to. All we think about is dunya. 
All we talk about is dunya. All we compete for is dunya. It's only about how much do I have, how much do they have. What are they wearing, what am I wearing? What are they saying, what, is, what am I saying? Where am I invited, who didn't invite me? Whatever it is. Who has more status, who has less status. That's all we see. We are just surrounded by it. And so all we see is the toy car. That's all we see. That's why it's so hard to let go. That's why if you try to take even a little bit from me, I would never let it go. We aren't willing to sacrifice even a little bit of our dunya for Allah. We aren't. We can't even sacrifice, okay, you know, I'm not going to get this interest-bearing loan. I'm not going to sell alcohol. I'm not going to dress in a way that is displeasing to Allah because it's the fashion. We can't even sacrifice seriously. Yani when we look at the sacrifices that people before us made, and we compare it to the sacrifices that we're not willing to make, we don't even want to give up this much for Allah. You tell me to wear hijab? No, but, but I, I don't want to give up the fashion. You tell me to dress modestly, but, but that's in fashion. We can't even sacrifice fashion, let alone our lives or otherwise. So we aren't willing to let go even a little bit because we're like that child who only sees the toy car. It's all I have, and so I don't want to let it go. You know this thing that the youth say, YOLO, you only live once? If you think that you only live once, you're not going to let it go. If you think this is all I got, there is no other opportunity, this is it, then you will hold tight and you will never let it go, even a little bit. But if you see something better, if instead of being so consumed with this life, and you instead see that there is a better life, that there is the real version of the car. The real version of this life is akhira, is the hereafter. But we don't see it. Even when we read it in the Qur'an, it's like, you know, we just read it with our tongues. We just, we just have this like theoretical concept, oh yeah, I know Jannah exists, I know there's a hereafter, but is it really real to you? Is it really something you actually think about and pray about and ask for and hope for and look forward to? Realistically, no. We're looking forward to the party we're going to next week. That's what we look forward to. It's just dunya. That's all we see. We haven't been able to see farther. That's why it's so hard to let go. But believe me, when you are given a choice between something better and something lesser, it's a non I mean it's it's a non choice. It's it's obvious. We're gonna choose what is better. And Allah tells us in the Quran, Bel tu'sirun al hayata dunya wal akhiratu khairun wa abqa. Do you prefer the life of this world when the hereafter is greater and more lasting? Khairun wa abqa. What is it that makes us so sad about this life? There's two things that make us really sad about this life, that disappoint us. First, is that it isn't perfect. We want things to be perfect, it's in our nature. And we become very disappointed when things are not perfect. We want our children to be perfect, we want our husband to be perfect, we want our wife to be perfect, we want our job to be perfect, we want our figure to be perfect, we want everything to be perfect, right? And we get disappointed when it isn't. Allah is saying that the hereafter, that, that Jannah is greater because it's actually perfect. It's none of this, yeah, okay, one thing goes right in your life but something else is falling apart. It's none of that. There is no sadness and there is no fear in Jannah. There is sadness and fear in this life, right? There is definitely sadness and fear in this life. But the hereafter doesn't have any of that. And second thing that makes us sad is that nothing lasts. No matter how beautiful you are, no matter you know how thin and how nice your skin is, 
20 years later, you don't look the same. And you can throw all the money in the world into plastic surgery, but it isn't going to make you live forever. Is it right? And it doesn't matter if you're an atheist or an agnostic or a Muslim, you can't deny that. And it's very difficult for people to accept that. That's why we have so many products out there. You know, all the creams and all the, the Botox and the plastic surgery. What's that about? We're trying to make a Jannah in this life. We're trying to make this life last forever. But it's impossible. And that hurts us in a very deep place. To think that everything is passing away. It hurts us. But that's because we only see this life. We don't see that there is a life where nothing passes away. That you don't get old. You don't get tired. You don't cry. You don't bleed. You don't get scared. You don't have to worry about anxiety and all these things that plague us. So why are we so caught up in this life? بَلْ تُؤْثِرُونَ الْحَيَاةَ الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةُ خَيْرٌ وَأَبْقَى Allah is asking us this question. Why do we prefer this life? He's saying, you prefer this life. I mean, it's a question and it's, it's a ridiculous thing that we do. We are preferring the toy Ferrari to the real Ferrari. That's what we are doing. But the reason we do that is because we're like that child who hasn't seen the real car yet. Our hearts really haven't seen Akhirah. We haven't really experienced and focused on the hereafter enough. And when you do that, through your remembrance of Allah, through your relationship with His book, with the Qur'an, when you start to do that, you will find naturally that this life doesn't become as important anymore. It becomes like the hotel room. It becomes like the hotel room. Because you know you're leaving. And everything is in perspective. The reason you don't get attached to your hotel bed is because you have perspective. You know, I'm only here for three days and I'm leaving. But if you thought that you were staying in that hotel room forever, you would act very different. Right? How do we act with our houses versus the hotel room? Because in our mind, this house is permanent, right? So we want to decorate it, and we want to get very attached to it, etc., etc. Our mindset is that we're staying here. But if we gained perspective, proper perspective, and we saw this life as temporary, and we saw this life like the hotel room, and we saw this life like the toy car, then it would be much easier to not be so obsessed with it. And now all of a sudden our concerns will change. Oh, you know what this person said about you? It's not the end of the world. You know what this person's doing or who invited you, who didn't, who called you, who didn't, you know, whether or not how you appear in front of people, your image, it's it doesn't become as important anymore because you see something more important. You see something better you see the real car. Similarly, when all we see is the creation, all we see is the creation, then the creation becomes the most important thing to us. And the reason is we haven't really seen the Creator. And of course I'm not talking about seeing Allah with our physical eyes because that's for Akhirah, inshallah. But we can see Allah with our hearts. Seeing Allah with our hearts means that we focus on Him and our heart is full of the remembrance of Allah as if we can see Him. Isn't that what the Prophet said? He said that the highest level of faith is to worship Allah as if you can see Him. That's, that's Ihsan, that's the highest level. And if you can't know that He sees you, if 
we could see the real car, if we could see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we wouldn't be so caught up in the creation. You know what that means? It means the more that I focus on and worry about what does Allah think of me? Or how do I appear to Allah? Or is Allah pleased with me? The less I'm going to be worried about what do the people think of me? What are the people saying about me? And are the people pleased with me? It's just natural because you're looking at something better. You're more concerned with something better. I'm going to end actually with a reflection about one of the ayat that was, that was recited, mashallah, so beautifully from Surah Al Hadid, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, He's describing this life to us. اعلموا أنما الحياة الدنيا لعب ولهم وزينة وتفاخر بينكم وتكاثر في الأموال والأولاد. Allah is telling us, He's describing this life to us, and He begins by saying اعلموا, meaning know. It's a command to know. Don't just think, don't just suspect. No, it's a fact. That the life of this world is la'ib. First description he gives is that the life of this world is play. And it's interesting because when you study the life cycle or the lifeline of a human being, and you think about when a human being first enters this life, what is their world revolving around? What does it, what's the most important thing to a child? Play. Play playing with toys, right? That's it. You want to get a child a gift, you don't get them a fancy purse, you don't get them fancy clothes, you get them a toy. Play. So the dunya, the entire world, revolves around play when you first come to this life. Laib. Then the ayah goes on to say, walah. Lahu is, is entertainment. Lahu is, is, is this you know, basically keeping yourself amusement. You know when a child grows up a little bit, middle school or so, what's it all about? Entertain me. Their favorite thing to say at that age is I'm bored. Right? It's like they, they need constant entertainment, constant stimulation. Like, entertain me, I'm bored. Unfortunately, we sometimes don't grow out of that, but... At that point, at that point, that's all it's about. Video games, movies, you know, it's like they constantly just want amusement and entertainment. So dunya is about entertainment and amusement. And then we get up and we, we grow a little bit, we enter into high school. High school now is that time when it's not about playing with toys anymore. It's not so much about video games anymore, although some people also never grow out of that. Um, it's more about how you look. How you look becomes of utmost importance. Right? Your image. This is when you are like taking two hours to get ready in the morning. Right? Allah says, لَعِذُونَ وَلَهُونَ وَزِينَ Zina is adornment. Adornment. At this point in life, Everything, your entire life revolves around adornment, around how you look, how you appear, your image. And then you grow up a little bit, and you graduate, or now you're starting to look for colleges and programs, and now you're trying to prove yourself. وَتَفَاخُرٌ بَيْنَكُمْ تَفَاخُرٌ بَيْنَكُمْ is that showing off, that boasting. Now it's not so much about playing with toys or video games or what you're wearing, but now it's about, well, what college did you get into? Oh, well, I'm in, I'm, I got in this college. What program are you, how much, or what job did you get? So now everybody's trying to prove themselves and everyone's trying to compete and everyone's trying to show off. Boasting. وَتَفَاخُرٌ بَيْنَكُمْ and then you get older and you settle down, and now it's not necessarily about play, video games, ador you know, what's your adornment, although we, some people also don't grow out of that. 
But now it's about competition. وَتَكَاثُرٌ فِي الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَوْلَادِ Now it's about collecting money and children. تَكَاثُرٌ فِي الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَوْلَادِ Is that, you know that mutual competition in now, oh, did you see her house? Or did you see her car and my car? Versus, would you, well, what's her, what, what's her kid? How much did, did, did your cousin pay for their wedding? And how much are we going to pay? How much did their wedding cost? Oh, but now they, they paid, they caught, you know, they spent a hundred thousand, we have to spend a hundred twenty thousand. This type of, this type of thing. It's, it's this competition now about money and about our children. وَتَكَاثُرٌ فِي الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَوْلَادِ Now Allah here, He spells it out for us. These are all the things that you get caught up in at different stages of your life. But all of that, كَمَثَلِ غَيْثٍ أَعْجَبَ الْكُفَّارِ It's like a garden that makes the farmer really happy. كَمَثَلِ غَيْثٍ أَعْجَبَ الْكُفَّارِ the nabatu, so that the now the the farmer is really pleased with the you know what they what they just what they have their harvest the the plants. ثُمَّ يَهِيجُ فَتَرَاهُ مُصْفَرًا And then Allah describes what happens. So the farmer is really happy with their harvest and their plants, but then what happens to the plants? يَهِيجُ فَتَرَوْهُ مُصْفَرًا It starts to crumble. It starts to dry up. And it becomes yellow. See this like rose? Is this, is this even real? It's real, right? It's really beautiful, right? But what happens after two weeks? The most beautiful rose in the world, after two weeks, it becomes brown. And it starts to crumble. This is a sign. And Allah tells us that the life of this world is just like that. فَتَرَاهُ مُصْفَرًا You find it becoming yellow, brown, مُصْفَرًا ثُمَّ يَكُونُ قُطَامًا And then it just becomes debris. Like just, you could take that rose that used to be, it used to look like this, and now you can actually crumble it in your hand, and it becomes nothing. And it would just blow away in the wind. After all of that, what's left over? وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ عَذَابٌ شَدِيدٌ وَمَغْفِرَةٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَرِدْوَانٌ After all of this stuff that we get so caught up in, just passes away, it, it, it crumbles, it becomes brown, and it crumbles, what's left? One of two things. The punishment of Allah, or His forgiveness and His pleasure. That's it. That's all that really remains. مَغْفِرَةٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَرِدْوَانٌ So either the عذاب, the punishment of Allah, and we ask Allah to protect us from that. Amin. Or the forgiveness and the pleasure of Allah. وَمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا مَتَاعَ الْغُرُوفِ And what is the life of this world except مَتَاعَ it's just chattel of deception. SubhanAllah, very, very profound. We need to reflect on these things. Allah has just in this ayah summarized everything we run after. Everything we run after our entire life. But all of it is all passing away. Just like the farmer who likes the plants for a while, and then it passes away. What really remains is whether Allah is pleased with you or displeased with you. أَقُولِ قَوِي هَذَا وَاسْتَغْفَرَ اللَّهِ وَلَكُمْ إِنَّهُ مَغْفُرُ الرَّحِيمُ سُبْحَانَكَ اللَّهُ بِحَمْدَكَ نَشْهَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهِ إِلَّا أَنْتَ أَسْتَغْفِرُكَ وَنَتُوبُ إِلَيْكَ وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ وَرَحْمَةُ اللَّهِ وَبَرَ